by Professor Chen. So, Professor Chen, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chen Zhongzhen. I'm from Taiwan Network Information Center. Uh, it's my great pleasure to chair the IPv6 readiness measurement both meeting. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this meeting. And as many of you know, the objective of the IPv6 readiness buff meeting is to establish the platform for exchanging or sharing not only the current status of the IPv6 readiness measurement result, but also sharing the technology or criteria used for evaluating the readiness. So uh, I'm very happy uh, today we have invited six speakers from several different organizations. Uh, thank you very much. And I also like to thank Miwa. <laughs> Miwa, thank you very much. And uh, Ai Qin, uh, Jinghen, uh, Seng Wei for, for their helping uh, arranging this kind of meeting. Okay, thank you. And now uh, I'd like to invite the first speaker, Kevin. Mr. Kevin from ISOC from Internet Society. Kevin, please. Okay. Please come to the stage. Okay. There's a stage. There's a stage. <laughs> Okay, so um, this, this presentation is probably um, an interesting fit in this session because uh, the Internet Society is not uh, an ISP. Um, this is not a presentation about uh, IPv6 deployment in a particular economy. Um, this, the brief was to provide uh, uh, information on you know, what's our state of readiness actually within the organization itself. Um, and this led to an interesting question in my mind, you know, what, what, actually what is the organization? Because uh, we have quite a, a unique and um, interesting structure at ISOC. Um, I should say see, here, I must point out, as there are members of the ISOC chapters in here, I'm talking about the, the, um, the worldwide um, corporate entity of ISOC. Of course, there are more than 100 chapters as well, which will also have their own, uh, uh, be doing their own things. Um, but this is specifically about the, 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 uh, the, the global entity. So we are a very, very distributed um, organization. Um, and we have nearly 100 staff. And I don't know exactly how many countries that they're based in, but I tried to count up two days ago uh, and gave up at 23 countries. So there's 100 staff in 23 different countries. Um, we do have actually two main offices. Um, the main office is in Reston, Virginia, uh, near Washington, D.C. And we have another major office um, in Geneva, um, in Switzerland. Um, there are at least three other regional offices um, officially, um, Amsterdam, Montevideo, Singapore. Um, I'm officially based out of the Amsterdam office. Um, but actually, many, many of the staff, and I think more than half of the staff, are actually based at home in various countries around the world. So you can imagine this is a bit of an, a nightmare to provide connectivity to everybody, um, particularly for the IT department, um, who actually, when I asked them, you know, could you provide me with some information on our IPv6 uh, deployment internally, they were a little bit reluctant to give it to me because... Uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult task. It's, it's not entirely consistent across every office and every country, and particularly getting to all the homes as well. Um, and you know, and I think that's fair comment. Um, but the one, the one, the one thing we do, that we do have as a benefit is that many of the staff are very highly tech savvy, so we do like to try the latest things, and we do like to say, you know, can we use IPv6? We go around the world and talk a lot about IPv6 and how we should all be deploying it and using it and trying to encourage take up. And certainly, you know, that's my job. I'm the manager of the Deploy360 program, which one of the main tenets is to encourage uptake of IPv6. So really, we should be doing this ourselves. Um, and we would like to do this ourselves. 
Um, and we're always trying to do this ourselves, but as we discovered, um, it's not necessarily always uh, straightforward. Just one thing to say is that we are predominantly a MacOS and um, iOS environment. Um, it's not exclusively so, um, but, but you know, that does... We do have a good head start there with, with IPv6, at least. Okay, so actually, how are we doing? Um, well, if it comes to the main offices, we're doing reasonably well. Um, we do run IPv6 internally, natively. Um, the office in Reston does have a native IV, IPv6 connection um, out to the internet. Um, the Geneva office runs IPv6 internally, but we're currently using a tunneled IPv6 connection, um, largely because the uh, ISP um, has priced IPv6 out of, the, um, um, yeah, out of an affordable cost. Um, I don't think it's a case that we actually can't get IPv6, but it's just, you know, there, there is a limited budget, um, and um, it was deemed that, that um, actually we'll tunneled IPv6 will be more um, cost effective. Um, I know from uh, working in Amsterdam, we do have native IPv6 in our office, such as it is. It's actually an office, physically one office. Um, and actually, we do have IPv6 in there. Um, that's provided by our ISP, which is NLNet Labs. Um, uh, so as you'd expect from a, um, a tech research organization, they're certainly very keen on that. Um, although I would say uh, we had an issue with the um, IPv4 DHCP server running out of addresses a while back, and so we defaulted. We actually had to use IPv6, and actually we had some interest. I mean, we did run into some issues there um, when we discovered we actually had to fall back on it. Um, with respect to Montevideo, I actually don't know. I wasn't uh, able to get back decisions in time. Uh, I didn't hear back in time, but I, I would expect they probably do as they co-located with LACNIC. Um, I would imagine that's the case. Um, and I don't think the Singapore office probably has IPv6 if that's in a managed facility. It may do, but, um, you know, if I had to be a betting man, I would guess it probably doesn't. <coughs> Uh, so, yes, um, with respect to our external um, presence, um, yes, our web servers do support native IPv6. Um, you can access them. In fact, you can probably try. And then, of course, after I've just stood up and said this, you'll probably find something doesn't work, but in principle, it should. Um, but then we also have a couple of, uh, of, of uh, shall we say, services, platforms, whatever you want to call them. Um, we have a sort of uh, a piece of software service, however you want to call it, um, known as ISOC Connect. It's based on some commercial, it's sort of based on the commercial Connect software. Uh, that's used for cl community collaboration, so I think that that's sort of electronic forums, mailing lists, polling, and that type of thing. Um, that doesn't... Um, uh, natively support IPv6, but we have a gateway which allows IPv6 connectivity. Um, but unfortunately, part of that does, doesn't fully support it, um, which means if you have an IPv6-only connection, um, you won't get certain parts of that platform, which is a little bit unfortunate. But um, we work quite closely with the, um, the software vendors and... and Push, push quite heavily to, to get the IPv support in there. Um, it's usually on the roadmap at some point, but usually in some unspecified time. Um, and you know, this is just the reality. Um, one platform we do use very, very extensively, and not just for external community meetings, but we use this internally a lot, really a lot. Um, this is really one of our key tools. Um, and actually, Zoom is a very, I find a very good platform. Um, it works very well on low bandwidth connections. Um, I was at the end of a satellite, geostationary satellite link with something like a 3,000 millisecond round trip time. Um, and actually, you could have a usable meeting on it and, and very good platform. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't support IPv6 at all, so that is a problem. Um, this is supposed we have a, we have a working relationship, and this is stated will be around sometime in 2016. So, I think watch watch this space. 
Okay, then we come to the internal services. Um, this is where our IT department, I think, tears its hair out, if it has any left. Um, so, you know, we have a sort of range of supported tools, um, often multiple tools <laughs> for, for the same function. Um, but departments have a little bit of habit of going and finding their own tools as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I have every sympathy for the guys that, that have to support this. Um, but one of our main sort of platforms, particularly for the um, email, is Office 365. Um, that's sort of doing reasonably well um, in terms of supporting IPv6, but not everything supports it. And I think this is a particular issue with Outlook, um, that it doesn't fully support IPv6, which is kind of one of the main things that we use it for. Um, so that's something that, you know, we have to work around. Uh, we use Box for, which is your know, cloud-based, um, should we say, file storage, sharing um, facility in the cloud. Um, that doesn't have any IPv6 support at all. Um, we don't actually have any roadmap for that at the moment. Um, so, again, those that want to use do document collaboration via IPv6 have to use something else. Um, Drupal and WordPress, they're sort of on the back of some of our web servers. Um, in principle, they are IPv6 supported, but actually there's a number of modules that plugins, whatever you want to call them, add-ins, um, that don't don't support IPv6 at all. Um, in fact, even the, the IPv6 number um, recognition module, I forget what it's called exactly, that seems to work in a strange way as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, it's sort of, you know, so you, you know, you find what you find is that some, you know, you, you, you make your website and then you find something's working and then other things don't work and it's a little bit sort of uh, hit and miss sometimes. Um, we use Basecamp. This is a project management tool. Um, apparently, we've had a very big project to research a suitable project management tool to, that will support IPv6, and we have yet to find one. So if anybody knows of one, then actually we, our IT guys would be very happy to hear from you. Um, Skype. That has historically been our um, video conferencing tool of choice. Um, it's kind of fallen out of favor a little bit in favor of, of Zoom. Um, historically, this has been a, not been IPv6 supported. Um, yeah, it's been a kind of core celebra for the IPv6 uh, deployment people to get IPv6 support in Skype. Um, I wasn't actually sure as I stated. I haven't really, I don't really use Skype that much anymore, um, so I haven't really sort of noticed. So I actually went and did some research when I was making this presentation. I actually couldn't find out whether it does support IPv6. It's a, I think, we think, and I asked the IT guys, is this IPv6 supported? And they said, I think it's supported in the business edition, but not in the, uh, the regular version. So actually, it's a little bit uncertain there um, whether this, okay, it is supported, says George. Okay, good. And then, okay, the success story is that Jabber, and we use Adium as the client generally. Um, actually, I've tried to find an IPv6 supported client on my iPhone as well. Um, uh, not with much success that works sat satisfactorily. Um, but anyway, our normal combination is add Jabber Adium, and actually this is a success, so it does work. Great. So what is our policy? Well, yes, of course, as you might expect, we want people to deploy IPv6. So our policy is we use IPv6 supported tools, and actually our IT department you know, genuinely does try to go out and find IPv6 supported tools. Um, but they're just limitations at the moment. Um, our hosting provider doesn't, doesn't support it. Um, one of the very big well-known ones, um, who everybody has heard of, a big, big name, who will remain nameless. Um, it's one of these things that is coming at some point, but we don't know when. Um, you know, and we sort of get, yeah, but there are alternatives. You know, there are, there are cloud providers that do this. But, you know, when you're a reasonable-sized corporation, you have contractual obligations, you've signed up for, you know, X period. Um, you've also got personnel who may not be entirely IPv6 um, au fait. 
Um, so you have to consider all these things. It's not just simply, well, let's just switch tomorrow. You've got a sort of legacy there, and, and it's a sort of process that you need to, to, to go through. Um, and, you know, and that's also a sort of barrier to, to deployment. And we're not a really big corporation, but we're not tiny either. Um, it, it's, uh, it just takes some, some time and effort. And, um, you know, it's not just IPv6 that everybody wants. They want every other feature in the world as well. Um, and, and it's just a sort of, sort of priority there. Um, and then, the, yeah, the real, the real kind of interesting one is that, you know, because, you know, ISOC staff are working in technology, they like to try out new things. Actually, there's always someone coming along with some new tool. I mean, I, it's almost impossible to keep up with how many new tools come along. And, you know, one day we're using something for calendaring, and then we found something else that we think is slightly better. It fits a particular bill for that particular day. And nothing else will, so we introduce that tool. Um, then we find a new tool which is even better. Um, so trying to keep up with it all is, is uh, I think, quite a difficult task. Um, of course, whilst, again, we would like it to be IPv6 supported, um, actually, sometimes you actually have to get some work done as well. And um, um, you know, we're sort of just forced by pressure of time and work to, to um, go, well, you know, this is something that would be nice to have, but uh, we'll, 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 you know, we'll have to look at that in a, in a, in at some point in the future. Um, so the, you know, the, the sort of you know the summary is that you know many many of the specialist tools that we actually do need um, don't don't have IPv6 support or not fully IPv6 supported. Um, and um, you know we've talked to the vendors and um, they say, well, you know we're not seeing any demand for it, and this is why we don't have it. And it takes work and effort and time. And um, so, you know, you can put your, switch your networks to IPv6. Um, you can run dual stack. You can run it on your laptops. You can run it on your end systems. But actually, we found the blocking part is in the applications. Um, and I, I know, you know, personally that, that I've tried to find IPv6 compliant, fully compliant apps on my iPhone. And it's much better than it was. But um, uh, you just find strange roadblocks in the way, like, you know, I wanted a, uh, an SSH client and I found one I liked, then it wouldn't resolve quad A records, for example. So this was you know, slightly defeated the purpose. Um, but, of course, the, you know, I've been talking about the sort of corporate office environment here. Um, the, the, we have a lot of home workers who just simply can't get IPv6 um, around the world, or it's, you know, you have to jump through a lot of... Uh, thing hoops to, to get. So you know, with like ISOC, like ISOC, like many um, is you know, we're we're a consumer of internet services. You know, we 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 advocate and promote the internet and new applications and new um, technologies. But actually, we we we're not a big corporation that can go go out and put our own infra roll out our own infrastructure. Generally, we have to buy in. Um, components and services from outside. So we are very much dependent on the overall state of global connectivity. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty well known that IPv6 capability in the world possibly is somewhere up near 10%, according to Google. I think APNIT would probably say it's a bit lower than that. Um, but, you know, it's certainly possibly up to 10%. But, you know, this, range, this, this varies hugely from country to country. So, we have somebody working in Ethiopia, there is apparently no IPv6 connectivity in Ethiopia, whereas we have a worker in Belgium where apparently it's 40% very, it's very, very good. Um, so, you know, it's a huge, huge diversity there. And I just wanted to bring in my own personal experience finally, so I'm nearly finished. Um, I actually have a very strange working life. I work in three places, um, in Amsterdam, Brisbane, and Oxford, which is an interesting combination. So just looking at my ISP, so I use, I, I take a service from Virgin Media in, in Oxford. Um, they appear to have no support for IPv6 and no formal timetable for rolling this out. Um, maybe they do, but they haven't said this um, publicly as far as I'm aware. Um, in Australia, I had... I had IINet, and I was one of the fortunate people where NBN works for me. Um, I was in a new apartment with a NBN um, box wired in. Um, very, very straightforward. Um, I did ask about IPv6. At that point, I couldn't get it. It may have changed. Um, I believe they had a trial, um, but it wasn't yeah, certainly available to the average customer that I could make out. 
But in Amsterdam, it's a bit better. So I had a, or I have a connection with, well, UPC is now Zigo. Uh, I don't know when it changed to Zigo when I was away, but um, UPC it used to be called. And they actually are actively making you use IPv6. Uh, they're rolling out um, IPv6, they're installing new boxes. Uh, I don't have one yet. I haven't been back for 18 months there, um, but I think it's worth looking up when I, I do. But I think the other point, the last point I wanted to make, um, actually, mobile connectivity is really the, the for me, important point. I've, I've the, the, the way I work and the way ISOC works is not just me. Um, I've been on the road for the last two weeks. I've relied very, very heavily on mobile, on, on 3G and 4G. I, actually, I found it much more reliable than actually being in a motel on a Wi-Fi connection. I found that pretty inadequate. Um, and for me, I found the, the most reliable connection has been actually been mobile devices. Um, so I think, you know, for me, that's also where it's got to be um, uh, very important um, to, to, to get IPv support in that. And I, I know that is happening. I mean, I, and I see George standing there. I, I was in a presentation where he gave a very good presentation about uh, which mobile networks are supporting IPv6. But um, unfortunately, the ones that I use don't um, at the moment. <laughs> anyway, I think that's my last uh, slide. Oh no, sorry, I did, there was one more. Um, I just wanted to mention, we, we are actively trying to test and deploy IPv6 through the Go6 lab. Uh, this is in Slovenia, it, my colleague Lan, Lan George is running this. Um, so this is actually our kind of commitment to actually really trying to do some real testing and deployment of um, um, IPv6 solutions. That is my last slide. Okay, so any questions? So thank you, uh, George Michelson from APNIC. Thank you for doing this, Kevin. Um, in software, people are used to the concept of dog fooding, having to live or die by the products of your own hands. And I think companies have to learn to do this too. And your experiences echo my experiences in APNIC. We go to product suppliers of services that we regard as critical. It's not on their radar. It's intensely frustrating. The Skype story is interesting. They have a very detailed debug page on V6 capability, and it makes it quite plain. It works, but there are well-known corner cases where it won't work, and they do say, if you find that, paragraph, drop back to four. So it is a work in progress, but it's not we're testing, it's out there. Mm -hmm. So the business product has it. Um, I wanted to say your three experiences of home providers, that is quite amusing. Virgin, no. Sky are already at 20% and are quite confident that they will have 90% V6 penetration by the end of the year. They've consistently stated they know their roadmap. This is a nation-scale deployment and it will single-handedly take the UK to approximately 20% V6 penetration. So you had a vendor choice issue there. NBN, I am on NBN, I am also on fiber, and I am with SkyMesh, and I have true dual stack IPv6. Mm -hmm. You have two physical ports coming out of your NBN box, and if you want to try an alternate provider to get six, you can. It's incredibly easy. I use mm -hmm. it ubiquitously with an Android phone with SSH. That just works, and it does DNS. Yeah. And your last provider, UPC, this is an ASN called Liberty Global, mm -hmm. and they have approximately five or seven economies in Europe they service. They are the biggest V6 provider in Ireland. They are one of the biggest V6 mm -hmm. providers in Germany. The Netherlands was off their radar and it's really exciting to hear that they're moving mm -hmm. up the food chain and they will, I think, have a very strong presence. But again, you could have gone with Access for All who have been there for a very long time. So the, the story there, I'm, I'm not trying to get at you, it is, it's consumer choice. You had choices and exercising those choices is very important. I actually left Internode for a variety of reasons and before that mm. TPG, who now own them. And when I left TPG, my exit interview with that provider stated, you don't do six, I can't stay. And I think voting with your feet is what we as individuals have. Anyway, I loved the presentation. Mm. That was really great. I, I would just add, you know, I, I, I agree with you totally. I mean, I mean I, part of it is a lack of inertia on my part as well. I mean, when I, when I sign in, you know, when I got my first um, um, MBN connection, you know, I asked and then it wasn't immediately available. 
from what I could see. Um, and then it's just, I didn't check after that. So it was just too easy not to change. So you're right, I, I could, there, there are options in Australia, particularly in, in Brisbane. Um, with the Sky thing, I, I'm definitely aware of that, um, actually, because you did a very good presentation on it, so that's why I'm aware. Um, but but um, with that, I physically have to get a different connection. I have to have my Dagen gut up, dug up to, to uh, and it's going to, my driveway and my garden will be dug up to, to get that. So that's kind of the, the barrier to deployment. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff, for your comment. Comments. Any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the sake of time, I'd like to suggest that each presentation may have 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes for presentation, and therefore we can have three minutes for discussion. So, uh, I'd like to invite the second speaker, Fujisaki-san from Japan, to introduce the current status of, the, of Japan IPv6 readiness measurement. Please, Fujisaki-san. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tomohiro Fujisaki, working for the NTT Japan, and also here with the hat of IPv6 Promotion Council Japan. Okay, here I'll introduce the Japan IPv6 status. Okay, the first slide shows the summary of IPv6 deployment status in Japan. And from the network viewpoint, many fixed, IS, fixed line ISP have started the IPv6 commercial service for their both enterprise users and their consumer users. And some ISPs have been migrating their existing IPv4 only customer to their dual stack environment without any user action. So the number of IPv6 users in Japan are increasing. And this is one, well, I think this is a big news, but we have three major cellular carriers in Japan, and all three stated that they will start full IPv6 service next year. So if this service start, will start, the number of IPv6 users in Japan will jump up. Okay, this is the network side view, but on the content side view, and the government service of IPv6 readiness are increasing. However, in Japan, the large content service provider do not support IPv6 yet. This is the current status of the IPv6 in Japan. Okay, in the next few slides, I'll explain the statistics of the Japanese environment. And I'll introduce from the six point of view. First is core network and application and access network and the user side and products and government services. Okay, let me start. And the first slide shows the IPv6 allocated prefix in Japan. As you can see, the red line, this is the allocated prefix and the green line is the announced prefix and the blue line is the active prefix and all prefixes are increasing. And next, data shows the IPv6 penetration rate in the internet backbone. The here, internet backbone means the number of the transit AS in Japan. And the right graph, sorry, uh, the left graph shows the worldwide average, and the right graph shows the uh, Japanese average. And as you can see, in this area, Japanese average is much higher than the worldwide average. Okay, in the next slide, few slides, I'll explain about the IPv6 user side penetration rate. And the, here, the target service is the NTT East and West ISP platform service. And also for reference, I'll introduce the KTDI, this is one of the biggest Japanese ISPs, and also the CTC service. And before I introduce the exact number, I'll explain the Japanese broadband internet situation. 
And this graph shows the uh, fixed internet service in Japan. I'm sorry, this graph includes the Japanese character, but the top red line shows the uh, total number of the fixed line internet broadband service. As you can see, September of last year, we have about 37 million subscribers in Japan. And in this 37 million, the, about 70% is a fiber user. And in this 70%, this bar chart shows the uh, market share of the fiber service. And as you can see, NTT East and West have the, uh, over the half market share in Japan. So NTT East and West internet service is a majority of, in Japan. And next graph shows the uh, IPv6 consumer service penetration rate in Japan on the, the uh, NTT East and West IPv internet access service. As you can see, end of last year, we have 12% of users, IPv6 users. And as you can see, the number of users are increasing. And next slide shows the uh, KDDI status and the uh, CTC status. And as you can see, KDDI finished to move their existing IPv4 users to the dual stack environment. So KDDI ISV users can access IPv6 internet. And also the CTC, number of CTCs IPv6 users increasing and currently over 80% users are IPv6 capable. And this, is the, this table shows the IPv6 traffic to Google servers in Japan. As you can see, the KDDI is top, top and CTC is fourth. And the, the rightmost number is the percentage of IPv6 traffic. So, for example, in the CTC case, over half traffic is to Google is IPv6. Okay, next graph shows the IPv6 users penetration rate measured by the APNIC and Akamai and Google. The, uh, the green line measured by the APNIC. Thank you, George. And the red line is Akamai and the blue line is Google. So as you can see, the rate is increasing and the end of last year we have the 10, over 10% IPv6 traffic. Okay. Since then, we, I introduced the uh, IPv6 penetration rate in the network side, uh, but the, here, from here, I'll introduce the content side. And these two graphs show the IPv6 penetration rate in the content side, web servers. The left graph shows the worldwide average, and right graph shows the Japanese average. As you can see, the number of the website IPv6 enabled website is much lower than the worldwide average. This is one big problem in Japan and we have to tackle this, this area. And this graph shows the IPv6 supported servers, .jp domain servers, in the uh, D DNS and uh, mail exchange, MX, and, and web servers. The number itself is increasing. And then next, this slide shows the uh, percentage of government service, web, sub, web service, mail service, and DNS service. The number is increasing, and in the DNS area, almost all servers are IPv6 capable. Okay, next graph shows the number of IPv6 ready local products in Japan. And just recently, we have four application, so the number itself are increasing, but for, before that, we have no application, and so, yes, we have to tackle this area also. Okay, this is final slide, and as I said, in Japan, IPv6 become popular, and ISP started the IPv6 service, both consumer and enterprise users. And as I introduced, mobile carriers that IPv6 implementation will be a big topic in Japan. 
Okay, this is end of our presentation. Any questions or comments? Is there any question? Any other question? I have one question. So, yeah. Fujisaki-san, your situation is, uh, it looks similar, very similar to the situation in Taiwan. So, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the government service availability, yeah. uh, up to now is about 50 something percent. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, do you have any national plan, national IPv6 uh, deployment plan to to, 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 to promote this kind of uh, things, okay. Yeah, in, in the sense there... Yeah. In Taiwan, we have yeah. one, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have the yeah, multi-stakeholder multi promotion committee in Japan, and we discussed the yeah, IPv6 implementation at that committee. And the, the, the cellular, uh, cellular carrier's implementation plan is the result of that committee, and of course, this kind of Japanese government service is the one target to, to increase the IPv6 experience your days. It's what well, discussed at that committee. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, here's some souvenir just for expressing our appreciation. And next, I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Mr. Tang from Yunnan, from VN Nick. Uh, he's the Deputy Director General of VN Nick. Mr. Tang, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Thang, uh, Deputy Director I know, of uh, Phoenix. Uh, we are also the standing member of uh, Vietnam uh, IP6 uh, Task Force. Um, my presentation, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the IP6 measurement uh, uh, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, my presentation is uh, just a few slides uh, give you some quick update about IP6 status in uh, Vietnam. Could you please turn on slide? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to take a look back at uh, our master plan for IP6. We have a national IP6 uh, master plan approved by uh, Michi of Information and uh, Communication about uh, four years ago. So now, uh, last year we finished uh, the second step in the uh, master plan, and uh, now we are going to uh, the third step and the uh, final step in uh, this uh, master plan. And uh, and uh, after we finish the uh, second phase, we uh, got the inform some information to evaluate the what uh, we are doing and what we get after we need the second phase. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the information uh, gathered from uh, third parties uh, like Google and Kamai, but uh, I focus on the information we got uh, by us. We, we got information from the, our member by the survey form and the report and the monitoring tool uh, developed by uh, VNIC. And uh, in the uh, second phase, we are already uh, start and launching IV6 officially uh, four year, uh, three years ago. And at the time, there are about six ISP working together, join together, and join with us to connect to Vietnam Internet Exchange to officer launch the IV6 in the core network and peering in the uh, Internet Exchange. And uh, at the time, there are some, some uh, website about 40 website, uh, some of them is the government. Uh, you can see, and some of them is a uh, content provider and uh, the corporate website, they turn on IP6. And uh, until now, the owner of ISP in Vietnam have an uh, international connection with V6, the stack and neighbor, with uh, some upstream provider like NTT and uh, Singtel or something like that. 
and but uh, the private peering, domestic private peering still limited. Just a few ISP peering to each other. So it's uh, not good for, for, for us or internet. And now we have uh, more than about 10 ISP connect to Vietnam Internet Exchange, have a IPv6 uh, enable, active appearing Internet Exchange. And uh, about the ASEAN network, uh, it's very limited. Now there are, there are only one ISP have uh, IPv6 service uh, for, for end user. They, they turn on in, uh, and provide a pilot service for end user, about uh, 90k uh, CP have an IP6 assignment, and they are is not they is not the biggest ISP. They are the third ISP in Vietnam, but they they going very fast in IP6 deployment. And as the ISP, the biggest ISP, two biggest ISP is not going on. They are very slow on that, and the bigger become slower. And about the DNS service. Um, Three years ago, dot uh, VN root DNS server I mean, has been turned on IP6 on uh, three server. You have a uh, six uh, DNS server over the world, uh, five uh, five of them in uh, Vietnam, and we are turn on uh, three DNS server uh, with IP6. And uh, as a sub level DNS server, is not not yet uh, turned on. Just about 30 server at the third, uh, second or third level with IP6 enabled. Uh, and uh, about the content service, now there are only one content provider. The, the, the third content provider in Vietnam, they turned on IP6 three years uh, ago. And uh, the other, so not so much, about 70 websites with IP6 enabled and two of them is a government agency and the rest is the enterprise. And email is not so much. And uh, the next, the mobile service, we uh, now using TZ, so we not focus on V6 on TZ. And uh, there are three uh, telco, the mobile operator uh, in Vietnam. And uh, next year, and this year, from this year, next year, we provide IPv6 for LTE. So they focus on uh, IPv6 for, on LTE, not TZ. Uh, for the CP for the fixed network, uh, we have uh, three vendor. The local, the local vendor, Metro, uh, they 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 have a uh, they own CP and all of them support V6 already. And uh, the final is the traffic, still very small. About the DNS query, uh, about two percent is the V6. And uh, for for a query for DNS about 17.5%. It's uh, it a little bit uh, growing, but it's very slowly. Yeah. Uh, when we finish the, the second phase, the ZZ of the second phase not uh, not much out of, out of our expectation. But it's it very good, it's a foundation for us to go into next step, next phase uh, from uh, this year. So from uh, the third phase, the final phase, we are focused on the peering, private peering in uh, domestic in, uh, and the asset network for and CP and provide the official service, the commercial service for end user. And uh, we also focus on mobile and LTE. Uh, now we are grant the license for mobile operator. They have a LTE license and they are do testing for IV6 for LTE. And so next year, we, they will provide V6 for LTE. And you also focus on content. Content is very important. If we don't have content, if we don't have uh, any user with V6, you can not have uh, any traffic for V6. And government agency and uh, the uh, e-government service should be uh, going on with V6. And about the measurement method, uh, we uh, focus on survey and report from our member uh, and. Uh, we uh, we set up some checkpoint in IAP network to gather information to do uh, some uh, statistic to to see what happened on the, the our network. And uh, this year we also turn on uh, Adflow on uh, Internet Exchange. 
to gather the traffic uh, about V6 and other from uh, third party tool. So that is, uh, I uh, finished my presentation here. Thank you, any question? Any question or comment? Yes. Yeah, I, wa I want to ask uh, in Vienna, Vienna, I mean the ISP upgrade the IPv6 uh, are mandated for the, by the government? At, um, we have a um, national master plan for IPv6 and the government uh, require all the most ISP follow the, the master plan. The each ISP must have their own uh, action plan on V6 and uh, it's uh, conform with a national action plan. But uh, as I said in uh, the second slide, there are only one uh, ISP, they, they are not uh, because the, the third ISP is going very fast on V6. Uh, as you know, they are not enough IPv4 access, so must, they must go in faster than other on IPv6 deploy, deployment. And the, the rest, two, two biggest ISP going slowly because they, they are enough V4 address, so they, so they going slow. Yeah. Okay, any other question or comment? No? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Jinghen Gu from Titanic. Okay. Please, Jinghen. I, for I forgot. I <laughs> it's a souvenir for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jin Hen from T Dominic. Uh, my presentation is about the Taiwan IPv6 uh, readily measurement. And this uh, uh, outline is to include the uh, IPv6 uh, readily measurement uh, criteria and uh, following the statistics uh, results. And the, the next uh, item is the conclusions. And the, uh, there are seven measurement criteria uh, in Taiwan. It's, uh, include as uh, network uh, part and uh, service part and the user part and the, the product part. And uh, in these criteria, there are three common criteria. And the uh, first uh, common criteria is IPv6 uh, location and BGP advertisement. And uh, there are 90 uh, members in Taiwan to apply IP addresses. And the uh, that as uh, 53 uh, members has applied the uh, IPv6 addresses, and uh, the 27 members uh, has enabled uh, IP, uh, in announced IPv6 uh, BGP. And uh, the data from the RAP NCC, we can see that the uh, 14 percentage. Uh, has announced the BGP advertisements in 2011. In the, in the end of the 2015, there are uh, 38 percentage has uh, announced the BGP advertisement. The, the second uh, common criteria is the service availability. The data from the T Dominic, the there are. 10,000 uh, web servers and uh, uh, 3,000 uh, email uh, DNS servers and the uh, 400 DN, uh, uh, email servers uh, has the enabled IPv6. The, how about uh, in the government agencies? Uh, there are 4,568 uh, services uh, in government agencies. Uh, need to be upgraded to IPv6. And uh, this uh, include uh, 3,000 web servers and uh, 400 DNS server, 400 EM email server, and uh, 23 uh, web T servers. And uh, the, in the end of uh, 2015, uh, the, these uh, servers are 100% to upgrade to IPv6. Is uh, included in the executing yen and uh, its subordinate agency and the uh, other central government agency and the local governments. 
And then uh, the data from right uh, APNIC, the this, there are six. Uh, this data is from uh, uh, Adisa top one million web websites. Uh, uh, there is a six percentage in 2014. It's close to the eight percentage in the end of the 2015. And the last, the last, the third, the common criteria is user availability. Uh, the data from the TWNIC, uh, there are for 26 uh, percentage uh, web queries from IPv6 in the uh, IPv6 portal in Taiwan, and uh, the two percentage in the TWNIC portal and the uh, uh, one percentage in uh, TWNIC registrars. trust. And the, the DNS query, the rate of DNS query from IPv6 is about uh, eight, uh, is a nine percentage in Taiwan. The, so the statistics from the APNIC uh, user availability, we can see that the, uh, the global uh, access uh, in, uh, in uh, using the website using the IPv6 is about 0.5 uh, percentage in the end of the, uh, the 2015. And the other measurement criteria is uh, the first one is the core uh, network. The IPv6 traffic in out of uh, Taiwan is about uh, uh, 307 uh, nine per, uh, megabit per second. And uh, the other criteria is uh, vendors. Uh, IPv6 ready logo of phase two is 298. Uh, and the first one is the 75. So the, so the, the rate of the two common criteria is IPv6 uh, location and BTV attachment and the service availability are gross uh, in Taiwan. And the rate of the user ability is, is still low. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, 49 customers in FTTX uh, servers could apply IPv6 access servers uh, online, but only less one percentage FTTX customers has applied the IPv6 access services. So in the future, the customer will be need to be encouraged to apply the IPv6 access services in Taiwan. It's, uh, it's a status of the uh, Taiwan's IPv6. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any question or comment? No? Thank you very much. Here's a souvenir for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to invite the next speaker. Mr. Wang, Sikang Wang from Zhonghua Telecom. Mr. Wang, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sikang Wang. I'm, I'm work on Zhonghua Telecom. Um, I will introduce the IPv6 progress and the challenges in Zhonghua Telecom. It's the outline. Uh, I will give the a short talk about the Zhonghua Telecom profile and uh, the IPv6 measurement in Taiwan. And then uh, we will uh, share the, uh, something about the fixed line. It's the IPv6 access deployment in Hong Gateway. And then we will change to the mobile part. It's the something IPv6 challenge in mobile network and uh, the Wi-Fi tethering issue. Uh, this is the Zhonghua Telecom profile. Uh, the uh, abbreviation uh, of Zhonghua Telecom is CHT. And this is our uh, URL you can visit. And CHT is the largest uh, ISP in Taiwan. And CHT also is Taiwan's largest provider of fixed service, mobile service, and the broadband access service. Um, about the Zhonghua Telecom major service subscriber, we have um, about four, four million 
subscribers in broadband service and 11 million in mobile service. Next, I will uh, give a, a short talk because the uh, previous uh, sp speaker will uh, already talk the IPv6 measurement. Um, there is a different source um, from different um, vendor or company like Google, Epinic, uh, ISAC, Akamai. Um, actually, the, we can just see the Taiwan IPv6 ranking. Tai, uh, in Taiwan, IPv6 use ratio is about um, 0.2 percent. Uh, it's, it's, it's very low. Uh, and the IPv6 use ratio ranking is um, 59. Um, then I will share about the fixed line um, challenge in IPv6. Uh, we all know uh, Home Gateway is like a C router, D DSL router, or Gpon or new cable modem, Wi-Fi AP. It's a significant device for IPv6 access deployment. Uh, in our company, we will provide a Home Gateway to customer for IPv6 internet connection. Um, but there's a problem. We want to know which Home Gateway is truly IPv6 ready. Uh, actually, every vendor claims his product is IPv6 ready, but is it real? So, um, fortunately, the IPv6 forum has recognized the need for the last mile IoT testing of the highly diverse C router market. So, the IPv6 forum and the IPv6 ready logo committee launched the IPv6 ready C router logo program on uh, 2014. The IPv6 ready logo C router can verify the product compliance with IPv6 core, DLCP v6, and RFC 7084. Um, actually, in IPv6 core, they also include many RFC, like uh, RFC 2460 and the DLCPv6 also have RFC uh, 3315 or the RFC 3633. Yeah, and the two part of test in IPv6 ready C route logo program is conformance test and the interoperability test. We also call it IoT test. Um, CHT Chonghua Telecom IPv6 Test Lab is the author of the IPv6 C router conformance test spec and also the technical reviewer of IoT test spec. Chonghua Telecom also provides a self-test tool and uh, verify vendor's product to get the IPv6 C router logo. You can uh, use the URL below to download the self-test tool. You can check your device by your own. Um, we, last year, our testing lab helped two products get the first and second C router logo in the world. You can see the um, product list below. The first one and the second one is from Taiwan. Um, based on the IPv6 ready C router logo approved list, ISP can purchase the certified IPv6 C router and and user can select the capable IPv6 device. We think it's helpful for the IPv6. Check the, you can check the approved device in below URL. And then I will talk, uh, take a um, short talk about the IPv6 challenge in mobile network. We all know Enjoy 5, that's Lollipop, or the iOS version uh, 4.3.1 or the Windows 8 uh, support IPv6 functions. But the situation in Taiwan is many Taiwan smartphone vendors do not implement IPv6 functions in firmware for potential customer service issue. That's because the ISP still not provide IPv6 service. No vendor want to implement a function that can be used now. 
But in the other hand, uh, it is also a hard decision for ISP to enable IPv6 if there are no IPv6 capable device because no one can use this service. So it's a big question which came first, the chicken or the eggs. Um, but until now, we are uh, uh, go to negotiate with smartphone vendors to turn on IPv6 function as default. Um, we, we get many positive feedback from the vendors in Taiwan. So we will work on this. And uh, about the Wi-Fi testing challenge, we all know the Wi-Fi testing in IPv4 is used the NAT, but not like NAT, uh, IPv4, there's no NAT in IPv6 world. So there are actually are three methods to implement IPv6 testing in mobile. The first one is DLCPv6 PD. This is the best. And the second one is Slack. Uh, you can use it extending slash 64 prefix. That is uh, definition in RFC 7278. The third method is COAT, that's customer side translator. Okay, but the challenge is uh, until now Android does not support DLCPv6 currently. So the first one is, is, is impossible for the Android. So we just choose the second one. There's a little test about the Wi-Fi testing. Um, this snapshot is from the hotspot router. Okay, we just turn on the Wi-Fi testing function and the, the router will get the IPv6 and the IPv4 address, dual stake from the ISP. We can see the address. And uh, we go to the hotspot client. Um, they can get the, also the IPv6 and the IPv4 address from the router. And uh, of course in the IPv4, they has used the NAT technical, so it's a private IPv6, IP, IPv4 address. But in IPv6, you can see the uh, prefix is the same with the hotspot router. It's the technical about the Slack. It's definition in the RFC. 7278. You can check it. And we use the client to do the web browser. We, we can see uh, because the IPv4 is NAT, so he will change to the public address to the internet. But the IPv6 there's no NAT, so it just used the global IPv6 address. Um, that is a summary of my talk. Uh, Zhonghua Telecom has already provided a FTTX based dual stake trial in uh, inter internet service since uh, 2011. It's a good news, more and more IPv6 router device get the IPv6 ready logos. Um, we are looking forward to IPv6 progress. The last one is, uh, I think it's less but not the, the list. Customer experience is most important, and our goal uh, is customer feeling nothing different in IPv6 and IPv4. So that's my talk. If you have any question, you can just. So finish it? Yep. OK, any question? OK, please. Uh, my name is Tang from Vinic. Could you be back to slide 11? About slide mobile. 11? 11. Okay. About the mobile, uh, mobile networks. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, some IP, uh, some telco provide the uh, V6 for, for mobile network. So I don't know which, which generation of mobile network you mentioned here. Is it 3G or 4G mobile network? Um, excuse me, can you say that again? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so so what, what kind of... Uh, Mobile network you mentioned here is a 3G or LTE. Okay, you mean the uh, which mobile brand I test, right? Mobile no. technology, 3G, 4G, LTE, oh. something like oh, that. Oh, sorry. Um, now in Chonghua, we provide 4G, LTE. Yeah. Yeah, and not not to the Volte. Volte is under test. Does there any requirement from the government to require all the uh, uh, 
uh, mobile operator to adopt V6 on the mobile network when they get the license from the government? Yeah, of course, the, we, we need a license to, to do that. But when uh, the government grant license for mobile operator, does they need to uh, support V6 or not? Or is it option uh, for, for mobile operator? No, our government not um, um, tell us you must to support IPv6, but um, they will um, cooperate with the uh, organization like TWNIC to push the ISP to do the IPv6. Oh, that's okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, sorry. Any question? Okay, thank you. So we, I will switch the next to the Miwa to turn in the, the rest of the section. Thank you very much. Okay, I can just give it to you. <laughs> Sorry, that's a small token to you. It just come on. Okay, right. Extra. Thank you. I was told to go to podium. Okay. Um, welcome to the APIPv6 Task Force meeting. Welcome back from the ad hoc Apric Apricot 2016 social event. It was just in you know, a network gathering over there in downstairs. So today we have a few speakers as usual. Um, Mike Viber, um, Australia IPv6 Forum. Unfortunately, he cannot be here, but he present he submit this slide set and he asked you to take uh, take a look at at your own time. He talked about the the current IPv6 deployment status. In addition to that topic, he also shared IoT and IPv6 topics. It's an interesting slide set, so please take a look at. Um, and uh, next speaker, George Michelson. I think he evacuated to so far away. So let's wait to see if he, he come back or not. And the third speaker, um, I, hold a moment. Can I see the um, web page here? Or, I, I, I can check in here. I have, I kind of, hold a moment. Okay. Third speaker is Akawata san? George Michaelson. Ah, no, no, sorry, Sumon. Sumon. Yeah, Sumon, can you please um, come over here? Thank you very much. Sumon is from Bangladesh, and he's going to talk about IPv6 deployment status in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome back after the fire drill. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, some uh, deployment status in Bangladesh, and uh, before going to IPv6, I just like to cover a few the connectivity towards Bangladesh, and uh, the network hierarchy in Bangladesh is a bit different, so I like to show that before going to the IPv6 issues. So this is uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we are presently connected with CV4 subband cable, and uh, we have redundant connectivity via India, and connected with multiple subband cables. And CV5 is about to come within this year. And uh, this is the typical structure of Bangladesh internet. On top, we have terrestrial cable system and subband cable system. They are connecting with the global internet. And then we have, we call it IIG, International Internet Gateway. They are basically the transit provider for the eyeball networks. ISPs and mobile operators are connected, like buying IP transit from the IIGs. And below that, all the broadband and all the enterprise customers lies below. So, so far, EPNIC uh, delegated 347 AS numbers and aggregated 515 IPv4 prefix and 121 IPv6 prefixes. <coughs> This is the Hurricane Electric report. We can see that among this uh, 121 IPv6 prefix and uh, uh, 347 ASN, uh, we have only 31 
AS number actually announcing their prefixes and uh, 62 visible prefixes from the global internet. If you look in the other way that in which segments, which operators actually enable V6. If we look at the top, like ITC and uh, submain cable systems, seven operators there, six of them actually providing native V6 transit. One of them not yet announcing the prefix and not providing V6 transit. In the IIG segment, the IP transit providers, there are 30 operators, among them 30 providing V6 transit. So they are dual stacked. And 17 of them not yet enabled IPv6 into the network. In the ISP internet service provider segment, we can see 81 uh, autonomous systems. Among them, 12 ISPs are actually dual stacked and they have announced their prefix to the internet. In the mobile internet, uh, in the telco mobile operators and the broad WiMAX operators, eight of them, among them three are actually announcing their prefix prefixes and five of them not yet enabled V6 into their, even in, with their upper streams. We have two internet exchange points, both of them are dual stack and offer IPv6 peering. If you look at the local content, I took this uh, list from the Alexa, the top 12 local contents. The missing numbers are basically the international contents like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, all this stuff. So these are all local contents. Among the top 12, I can see two of them actually only have v6, native v6, and you can reach those websites via IPv6. And incidentally, I found that both of them hosted in Cloudflare. I don't know if the Cloudflare credit or the, this uh, website guy is actually enabled IPv6. Uh, this is data from Cisco Lab, and uh, uh, the amount of local content v6 enabled. You can see that uh, the percent is with v4, v6 is uh, quite low. And the number increased because of they actually included the google.com.bd, yahoo.com.bd, so the number, we can see the number. In fact, most of the local content are still not IPv6 enabled. Last year, a good thing we have done that we have uh, enabled uh, IPv6 in the both .bd, cctld, and the upcoming .bangla IDN, and all the servers are now responsive to IPv6, and a BDNOC team actually supported the incumbent telco to implement v6 there. And uh, if you look at the, the another process of ripe NCC view that only 10% ASN is announcing IPv6. And if you see that uh, there is some ups and downs, and uh, what uh, I can find out that uh, when there are some new licenses given and new AS number taken from the APNIC, and they are not enabling V6, so this ratio is coming down, and again, gradually going up. And uh, at this moment, we can see only 10% AS in the NSA IPv6 prefixes. I tried to compare this with the other neighbors in South Asia, like India, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and if you see that Nepal, India, and Bangladesh are actually following the kind of similar progressive path, but Sri Lanka, I, I see very uh, comparatively in well ahead, and I found, I found that there were only four or five operators, and all of them at least enabled V6 into their transit, and uh, as some of the universities in Sri Lanka actually deployed a V6, so they have a little more user base. Again, in Bhutan, there is only two operators, and one of them, surely, wouldn't telecom, and others also maybe, I'm not sure, but uh, so they are actually, percent wise they're a little bit high. If you see the user perspective, that how many users actually, a broadband, or this kind of uh, users actually using native IPv6 services, in that respect, uh, uh, from the Cisco data, I have seen that Bangladesh has a 0.01%, but Sri Lanka also has 0.01%, and India has literally higher 0.59%, and Bhutan has 1.12%. So actually, I tried to look for why actually there's a, you know, some ISPs, they have uh, native V6 up to their core networks, their office PCs are V6 enabled, but why they're not giving to the customer, to the broadband user or to the 
the enterprise customers. And uh, some engineers told me that uh, their issue is that their PPVOE server and radio server is so long before and not this enabled, they need to change it or upgrade it. They are not doing it. And another issue is with that they are the old bandwidth managers. They, those are not dual stack. So they need to upgrade this. And if can do that, they can actually easily offer native VCs to the broadband users. Regarding enterprise customers, and uh, most of the ISP told that they talked with the customers, but they're quite happy to leave behind that, and uh, they're not that much aware, actually, that they really need V6. So the demand is not there, so that, that's why they're not deploying as V6. Our government, uh, Sometimes, sometimes I talk about IPv6, and I notice that when we have a beginner conference or standard conference, we talk about IPv6, then government took an initiative, and suddenly it dies down. Recently, December 14, the government bodies asked for IPv6 workshop for the government IT officials, and we have done that, and we have got a lot of enthusiasm. But again, there is no response. We have next bid in May, and within a week, we got a call that they did a IPv6 conference, and I have to present a paper there that what we should be doing for deploying IPv6. But since then, again, uh, government has got silent. So in every area, actually, we, we have some option to do something. But in the community side, uh, from SANOG, from BDNOG, from ISPAB, we regularly hosting IPv6 workshop for the network engineers, try to ISOC, Internet Society Dhaka chapter, have a couple of events to create awareness among the users for IPv6, those who are doing. But uh, still, the progress is not that much, actually. So for uh, last year, I reported there's two households actually have native IPv6 connectivity. Now it's one because one of them moved to Brisbane. So the one IPv6 connectivity, I know at this moment, this is my house have native IPv6 connectivity. So this is the situation. Before coming here, actually, I had an opportunity to talk with the ISPA officials, and I asked them why you are not doing it. So it's found that actually the management level, they don't have that awareness that we have to have V6. And uh, they promised me that uh, before next ethnic meeting in Dhaka, we'll see some residential broadband users having native IPv6 connectivity. And uh, as well as we need to create awareness among the corporate IT teams. Probably we need to invite them more in the NOG meetings so that they feel need of the physics. And regarding the government, probably same thing to apply that uh, we have to engage with them and we have to convince them. Then actually, a lot of government websites are now they're offering service over internet, but all V4 enabled. If they move them to V6, then I think that will create some incentive for the operators to move to the IPv6. In the mobile operator segment, uh, they, some of them actually deployed IPv6 into their core network and they're announcing their prefixes, but not yet in the user segment. And uh, so far, I didn't find any fixed plan that when they will be deploying IPv6 to the network. So that is the, so far the status of Bangladesh IPv6 deployment. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions I can take? Thank you. Um, due to that um, uh, fire evacuation exercise, there are some change of order. So next speaker is from IPv6 Readiness Measurement Buff. Um, speaker Sebastian Castello um, from NZRS, New Zealand IPv6 Measurement. Sorry for other speakers. Can you please wait for a while too? Thank you. While we wait for the slides, um, I had a conflict of um, a schedule. I was presenting on the room on the side, so I couldn't be here on time for my presentation. So they reshuffled, reshuffled my slot, and then we have the fire alarm, and then for, they forgot about me, so I have to go. go. Please, can you give me my slot? So my name is um, Sebastian Castro from NCRS. 
we are the .NET uh, registry. So we manage the .NET uh, domain names uh, space from the technical perspective. And we have a research function, a research team that takes care of, um, that's not the one, that's from the other room. That's not the presentation. That's for the room next, the, the, the room number two, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so I was saying, um, my name is Sebastian Castro. I work for NZRS and Limited. We are the .NZ um, registry. And I wanted to share some of the metrics we have for IPv6 deployment. So some of them are ours, some of them are from other organizations. So we will give you the same kind of picture that everyone else has been sharing about, yeah, we are in that stage of IPv6 uh, adoption. If you want to go and skip to the end of the conclusion, it's like, it's, it's really bad picture for New Zealand, um, which is strange because we have this really good and strong deployment of fiber uh, in, in the country, as you saw during the, the plenary by the, the video by the minister, Amy Adams, and we don't have IPv6. So maybe it's a um, lecture the, you, or a conclusion in life. You, can, you cannot have everything in life. So we have fast broadband, but no IPv6. Yeah, definitely a day where things went wrong. Uh, that's me. Excellent. So I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet so um, we can actually go for the end of the day, have a break. So <clears throat> this is a presentation with a collection of metrics about IPv6 in New Zealand. Um, from a high level point of view, you can have different metrics. You have, have things that you measure either passively or actively. So a passive um, measurement will be collecting data as things happen. So that's most of the metrics you have in here. So we count packets, we count network prefixes, addresses, uh, queries in devices or so services and, um, and devices. But we can also have active measurement. So create an experiment in order to go and detect certain uh, situation, which is what the APNIC uh, team does. So uh, uh, first I will introduce you the, the data we collect at the Dorenset um, registry. Uh, some of them are active, some of them are passive. So we have a large amount of DNS data. So we have the Dorenset, uh, the queries for Dorenset. And it's a large data set, it's three years worth of data um, that actually includes Quare queries and also include IPv6 queries. So the Quare Quare queries gives you the an idea of hosts interested on finding out IPv6 addresses, and the IPv6 queries. So DNS queries coming from IPv6 addresses give you the idea of DNS clients using v6. But we also have an initiative we call the Sonescan, where um, so the gentleman from Japan had similar data, where we go and find all the uh, domain names in the .NZ namespace, and we uh, check if they are publishing what uh, addresses for the services. Uh, and we have that data for two years. So we have a, a kind of a good view of this. So for the DNS queries, we get traffic, we preserve traffic for um, four name servers. Uh, they are all based in New Zealand. Um, and, and two of them have IPv6 addresses. Uh, there is a really interesting story behind that because we actually had three at some point, And the provider where the name server was uh, installed disabled IPv6 from uh, one maintenance. So they did a maintenance window one night and the other, next night we didn't have IPv6 for the name server. So you might understand we were like really angry at them for disabling the ser service. And they took like, 
a year and a year and a half or even more than that. No, what was more than that in order to restore it. So there, there's, there was no feeling of IPv6 being important and being the, the name service for Dorian set being important. In any way, the, the curve you see here, sorry, the curve you see here on the back is, um, so red, laser. The red one is uh, before traffic, so uh, coming from a before address, and the blue one is V6. So you see there is a slow scroll in there, but most of the traffic we get is before, so there's nothing unusual. And um, you see them, th this is, starts in January 2013, so um, we have one data point per day, so that's why you see the spikes. So it's um, the usual daily pattern of Monday and Fridays being more busier than weekends. So the solid line is the smooth uh, curve. So if we go and take a look, closer look to this data, we can see there is some growth and there is some, some jumps from time to time, but the volume is slower and the rate of growth of this traffic is way slower than before. So that's the first signal that things are not going, uh, it's not a pretty picture. The second um, plot here is counting the qu uh, query type, so using A or Quad A. So again, the same uh, color coding and the same idea of on a smooth curve. And, and on this one, you can see there is a jump around January 2015 where it starts growing the traffic. So this kind of queries gives you an idea of DNS clients that are interested in getting uh, uh, Quad A queries. So in the way the resolver goes and asks for the A, um, for the IPv4 address and the IPv6 address more or less at the same time. So there is a better picture in there. So now we, we review data collected by third parties. So we, there's nothing too new here. So again, it's RIPE and B6, uh, six labs from Cisco and APNIC. Um, so it's a general summary. So we have the Google IPv6 stats, the Akamai IPv6 stats. They published that data in the state of the internet report. Um, allocations versus visible prefixes um, by six labs and are, are um, ripe, and the APNIC, IPv6 active measurement. So Google, uh, well, no. yeah, there you go. So 1.6% adoption for New Zealand. Uh, I was checking uh, in the other room and uh, the apricot event in New Zealand actually increased the adoption by like 1% because the network is uh, IPv6 enabled. So you see how sensitive it is to one event go and increases the adoption of IPv6 in a country by 1% in a week. So success. But if we can compare each other to New Zealand, uh, New Zealand with Australia, which is a thing we usually do all the time, um, you see the numbers are more or less the same. So according to Akamai, we are in 0.9%. So the methodology Akamai uses is they count the number of object requests received via IPv6 and then divide it by the total number of ob object requests per country using their CDN. So this could be um, a, in an image, an HTML file, a JavaScript, can be anything. So again, we are down. It's really depressing, so 0 0.9 is really depressing. Prefix allocation, so six labs uses the data from route views and the RIRs, uh, and they define it as allocated, routable, and alive. And ripe stat has the same data. So this one is kind of hard to read, there's too, too much black in there, and this one will benefit of being bigger, but you're familiar with this. So I went and I pick up the raw data and decided, well, so if IPv6 is growing in New Zealand, it should be growing faster than IPv4. So the number of IPv6 prefixes visible for New Zealand should be higher, also should be growing faster than the IPv4 ones. So uh, what we have here is the ratio of IPv6 versus IPv4 
prefixes visible by um, ripe. So you see there is some growth, there is some jumps in here and there, but the numbers are really, really low. So we are not accelerating our IPv6 deployment. So, and finally, the, the nice and pretty um, APNIC IPv6 measurement it puts New Zealand in 2.49 uh, compared to Australia with 3.37. So we're still under New Australia on this and it's still really low and it's not, not making any change. So there are some other measurements you can actually go and get. Um, the um, efforts of, so tracking the Alexa top 50 per country, I'm not a really big fan of using Alexa but because it has uh, some serious bias. And using the, the web scan we have, we get all websites and all domain names in, in the Doran set name space, so I, we think that's a better metric. Um, Eric also had the IPv6 enabled BitTorrent peers, which is an interesting number. And uh, you can get S flow stats from the IXs. So I tried to dig some uh, numbers from the local IXs and I couldn't get any. But I'm aware the, the local IXs do have IPv6, but I don't know how much traffic they're moving through there. So that's me. That's my contact details. And I'll be around if you want to talk about doing experiments on V6. Thank you. Any questions? Are you here? No. Everyone gone. Yeah, thank you. So next speaker is uh, George Michelson from APNIC. He's going to talk about API IPv6 task force economies, IPv6 capability from APNIC measurements. Hey, everyone. I just want to let you know, this pack has 150 slides. <laughs> but I'm only going to talk to 10 of them. And I put all of the data in there because I thought it was about time I treated this community as a, as a whole. And instead of just isolating a few, I say, look, if you really want to know what's going on in these economies, here's all of it. So. You've seen these talks before. You understand our methodology. Some people are measuring traffic at exchange points. Some people are measuring amount of rooted space, number of prefixes visible, ASs with six. We're not doing that. We're measuring end user eyeballs that are able to see our advert. We're measuring end user capability. And we know this is the blocking point. You all have V6 in your core network it's making that reach out into the customer network through the CPE and into the home that's the problem. So I've produced a summary and I've taken the data from all of the measurements in the lab site and I've put them together to show the top set of the people with high V6 capability. And then I've shown the same list but sorted by the number of samples we saw, which is an approximation of eyeballs. It's kind of not market share, but it's similar. And then to be a bit more generous, I've taken that sample set, 200 of them, and I've second sorted it by their V6 capability to try and pull out who is actually visible. So this is the first one. This is the top set by V6 capability. If you look down the left-hand side, you can see there's a really lovely spread of economies. So if we look at this view, it's possible to say, you know we have quite a lot of diverse economic engagement in V6. It's happening everywhere in our region. That's pretty positive. If you look at the kind of category that people are in, I've highlighted three companies that I recognized are participants in customer-facing service. 
That's not to say that the other ones aren't, but I recognize these three. So on the top set, the most V6 active, we have a telco in Japan, and we have the same company with two different ASs operating in two different economies. I don't think they actually supply service to end users, but I think they're active in the field. But looking down the rest of the list, these are essentially research networks, CERNET, Google, that's their own activity. I don't know this group, I don't think they're in general service provision. It's a university, it's a university, it's a research group, it's an internet company, it's a university, it's a university, it's a university. So when we go to the who are doing most V6, it's about academia in this region. And this is the classic signature of economies where there is not yet enough structural investment to make V6 happen in a commercial facing context. The competency is there. The capability is there, but not the economic investment that is going to make this a real activity in front of customers. So this is the list sorted by eyeball share. How many people did we collect samples from? And if you look here, you can see that this is a collection of ISPs. China Net Backbone, they use the AS name as the backbone, but this is clearly providing mainline service in the People's Republic. Pakistan Telecom, VMPT, China Backbone again, CNC Group, you know, Philippine Long Distance Telephone. And it's not until we come down to Malaysia that we see a provider. This is a former monopoly telco, and they have 17% coverage. So the first player in the large sample set is a former monopoly telco, in Malaysia and everyone else on this list is essentially showing up as having no significant V6 capability in front of their end users. If I were going to do a presentation with only one slide, this is the slide that I would show you. Because essentially, with the exception of possibly Chunghua Telecom and my comrades from NTT, very few of these people are actually in the room. They don't routinely come and participate in this conversation because their main focus is on delivery of service. Chunghua, I realize they are very involved in your national initiatives in Taiwan to try and develop IPv6 as a customer facing service. And we had that presentation earlier. And we know that NTT and their national fabric are looking at some issues around the provision of V6 and the nature of that layer two service and how other companies can make use of that. We know that you're confronting technological issues, but you guys are trying to make it work. And I think in 2017, that's going to happen. But if you look down these lists, this is a list of major public companies that have essentially no visible activity that is going to achieve V6 on their customer base, and they don't come into our dialogue. And that's why this is the most important slide. Because if we are going to affect change, we have to talk to these people. We have to. We have to engage with them. We have to engage with their boards. We have to engage with their CFOs. We have to engage with their CTOs. And we have to say, you guys have to arrange for the capital investment that's going to bring V6 into public use. So, this is the more generous list. This is the top 200 by capacity in size sorted by capability in V6. And I've highlighted a collection of entities that to my mind represent deployment at scale. Sony were on one list, they kind of dropped off here, but Starhub in Singapore, you can see that they're doing a massive rollout. 54%, 52% rather, is now capable in Singapore. That's really good. KDDI, Gig Infra, SoftBank, TM Net is showing up, Telstra are beginning to show up in this, Starhub. So in Singapore, we have two references, same company. It probably means that they have two different routing strategies, but it's getting deployed. You know, this is like, this is significant stuff. If we go down the list to this company here, this one is actually really very interesting because this is a company that have responded to outreach from APNIC and have engaged with us in a discussion about how to test V6 and deploy V6. And I'm hoping that this is a sign that capacity is going to come up in the Maldives. So this is quite interesting. So this is the more optimistic view of how we're doing in region. Okay, so what I feel this is telling us is that 
there is a really good signal of competency and capability because the academic communities throughout the region are active. But the eyeballs, the significant players in commercial service delivery are really not there, with one exception. So the more generous view says, well, there's a lot more capability, there's a lot more going on. But there's no single widespread picture here. We get a diversity of behaviours depending on conditions. I would argue economic conditions in the economies in the task force. And the only way out is to engage. Something we haven't previously shown you that we now have in our data is exposure of the effect this has on individual types of device. Because we were previously measuring with flash, we actually couldn't account for significant volumes of usage, but we now use HTML5, and we are able to see mobile devices. Amusingly, the network here that we're using has gone to the top of the list in New Zealand. We are accounting for a significant percentage of New Zealand IPv6, because your Wi-Fi phones, your iPhones, your Android devices are getting a V6 assignment. We've seen 96 measures from here, and we've achieved 70% V6 capability just at this meeting. So this is a view of TMNet by device. The thick line, the thick blue line, and the thick red line that you may be able to see, they represent the mobile devices and the non-mobile devices. And the thinner lines separate out specifically iOS and Android. And the thing that you're going to see here is this is basically grouped together. There is no distinction in capability. There's some randomness, but to all intents and purposes, no matter what device type you use in TMNet, you get V6 at approximately the same intensity as anyone else. This is a very strong signal that the technology they're using is a true dual stack deployment. There's no bias against any class of user. So we get a sense from this that what they're doing is kind of equally available to all kinds of users in that deployment. This one is one of the most significant deployments in region. This is SK Telecom. We have a problem in our measurement that means we don't properly account for the volume of traffic coming from Korea. And we had a very good discussion from the principal researcher in this field, is it Kiza, is the body, who came and spoke to us in the meeting in Japan recently, and he made it very plain that we have a flaw in our model. This company, SK Telecom, represent approximately 50% of the mobile capacity of Korea. They are an enormous company. And they have done an extremely significant deployment using the 464 Translate technology. And if you look on this graph, although it's very noisy, you'll see that there is a signal there of a divergence in behavior between the iOS and the Android platform. Actually, this is the graph about the relativity of measure. I've, if I got the later slide pack, I show you that essentially we see almost 100% capability from the Android handsets, and we see none from the iOS, because iOS as a device cannot use the 464 translation technology. If we were accounting for this ISP properly, we would actually have Korea's capacity at approximately double its current measurement. We would see them at a sustained level of around 4%, because I think two-thirds of Korea is on mobile, and about one-third is now on broadband use in the home. There are some structural issues around the broadband deployment that make it hard for V6 to go into homes in Korea. But mobile is really significant, and we actually would show a significantly higher level if we could adjust for this measurement error. But what I really want to show here is that the transition technology they're using, noting that it doesn't work with iOS, it absolutely works. These guys have succeeded. This is a really clear, strong signal that if you're using transition technologies, they work. So you have to understand your local market conditions. If you had a large footprint of iOS devices and you were a cellular provider, you might not be able to use this kind of technology. But if Android is the predominant device in your market segment, these transition technologies can be very, very good for you. And cellular, it's actually a good place to explore because you, the provider, you have complete control over this behavior. You create a new APN and you associate the V6 behaviors exclusively with your new APN and you don't disturb any existing customers. And you then go out and you try V6 with specific classes of people and build competency, build capacity, 
build out V6 on your, v your LTE or 4G deployment, and then you just flick over to this new technology. So if you wanted to explore V6 and you're a nation-scale deployment, cellular is a really, really good product to do this in. The other thing we get from this is that the technology neutral deployments that get done in home networks like cable are wonderfully equal for technology type. So if you are lucky enough to have a cable plan that's using modems that can be upgraded to DOCSIS 3 or ADSL 2 technology which is capable of supporting dual stack, you won't bias against what people are using in the home. We have good evidence from what we see from um, TMNet that this technology is very equal, equally available to the handsets that people have. Okay, I'm going to stop there. The rest of the pack is literally 150 slides providing a breakdown of what happens in all the economies in the region. I'll give you just a quick example. Um, I'll go to one that has a bit more da data. This is Australia. So we show at the 100% scaling a very low level of uptake, but we have a top 10 sorted by capability and then we have a top 10 sorted by market share. And I've provided this for every one of the economies that are in the task force so that you can go and look at your own if you'd like to understand them. Anyway, that's all I have to say. If you don't ask questions, we can go and have beer sooner. Brilliant presentation. Thank you, GGM. So next speaker, um, Kawabata-san. Um, he's from uh, JP Nick, and he's going to talk about IPv6 outreach effort in Japan. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Hiroki Kawabata from uh, JPNIC, uh, Japan Network Information Center. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, <coughs> we are IP address registry in Japan, uh, like as APNIC. Uh, I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about outreach activities in Japan. Uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to share with you about uh, the, uh, the activities for IPv6 uh, deployment in Japan. Uh, in Japan, uh, there are several organizations to work for promoting IPv6. The, uh, this slide shows uh, some of these organizations which I introduced this time. Uh, for uh, uh, more information about each organization, uh, please refer to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this uh, URL. Uh, first is, uh, first is uh, IPv6 uh, Promotion Council in Japan. Uh, we sometimes call uh, V6PC. Uh, they focus on collaborating with uh, government, uh, industry, uh, academia, and uh, other internet bodies to promote IPv6. Uh, there are some active working groups. Uh, for example, uh, Home Router Working Group published uh, IPv6 Home Router Guideline. And uh, v uh, V6 Fix Working Group uh, published the document to introduce IPv6 uh, smoothly. Uh, certification Working Group and uh, Business Learning Working Group uh, uh, provide, uh, provided a logo program. Uh, this slide shows uh, uh, their IPv6 measurement activities. Uh, they have measure, uh, measured IPv6 deployment status uh, since uh, 2012. Uh, for the, uh, point, uh, from the point of uh, core network, uh, applications, uh, access network, uh, user, users, uh, products, and uh, government IPv6 service. service. Uh, they select uh, many indicators. These uh, figures on this slide are IPv6 uh, consumer service penetral, uh, penetration rate in Japan. If uh, you are uh, interested in the uh, measurement, uh, please see uh, Fujisaki-san's uh, presentation at IPv6 uh, measurement booth. Uh, next is uh, Internet Association Japan, uh, we call uh, IA Japan. 
Uh, they focus on promoting uh, IPv6 deployment in, in rural area. Uh, the uh, IPv6 deployment committee had a regional IPv6 summit a few times in a year uh, since 23. Uh, the figure uh, on the right, uh, there, are 40, uh, there are 47 prefectures in Japan. Uh, they, uh, they have published the map of the uh, prefectures uh, where uh, they had the summit. This slide is the detail of IPv6 summit in 2015. Uh, 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 they had the regional IPv6 summit and one regular IPv6 summit in last year. When uh, they, uh, they plan programs, uh, there are uh, uh, three important points. Uh, one is to share global or uh, Japan's IPv6 development status. Second is to share about, about the uh, IPv6 development status of the region uh, where uh, they have the uh, summit. The last point is uh, to discuss about promoting uh, IT and IPv6 deployment at the region. Uh, many of presentations are talked by the uh, 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 many of presentations are talked by the speakers uh, who uh, belongs to uh, local IT community. Uh, next slide is uh, Japan Network Information Center, uh, we call JPNIC. About uh, promoting IPv6, uh, we collaborate with uh, the IPv4 exhaustion task force in Japan. Uh, JPNIC provides uh, more knowledge for ISP technical operators. Uh, this year, uh, we have planned IPv6 technical hands-on seminar. We collaborate with uh, regional ISPs and uh, head uh, nine times in five cities and the JPNIC office. Uh, total attendees are, are 100. In this seminar, uh, they study uh, the IPv6 settings of network equipment, uh, like as router and server, uh, using uh, our test bed. Uh, last is uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Uh, we call uh, MIC or MIC. I inter uh, introduce IPv6 promotion research group. Uh, the uh, research group was established uh, on 27 to clarify the uh, cha challenge of deploying IPv6. Since then, uh, it has published some reports. Uh, after uh, the uh, first report published, uh, collaborating with uh, government, industry, uh, academia, and, and other bodies, uh, each other, uh, they proceed with uh, uh, promoting IPv6 deployment, uh, supporting IPv6 more fast in the fixed line network is one of the great results. Uh, the latest uh, research report published uh, on uh, January this year. Uh, this, uh, this report mentions uh, the importance of IPv6 toward uh, the IoT era. And also the report describes uh, the mobile carrier and MVMO, uh, mobile virtual network operators, uh, will start uh, the whole IPv6 service until uh, 2017. And, uh, Public Wi-Fi and uh, content delivery service uh, also need to uh, support IPv6. Uh, this is uh, all my presentation. Uh, thank you. Japan has consistently um, making an effort to reach out the regional area. So it was really nice to learn from Kapata-san. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is um, Carlos Martinez from LACNIC. 
Um, his presentation is IPv6 adoption in Latin America and Caribbean. Carlos, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, after this very emotional afternoon that we had, um, <clears throat> really exciting. I promise to keep this short and sweet so we can go to whatever they do in the next room. That they, you, can, you, you can hear people laughing and glasses clinking. So the idea was to bring you a short update on the state of IPv6 uptake in the Latin American Caribbean region. Um, I, I guess most of you know what LACNIC is. LACNIC is the sister organization of IPNICS, but in Latin America and the Caribbean. <clears throat> Roughly our service, our service area covers all the Latin American countries from Mexico all the way south, with a little mix of the um, coverage in the islands of the Caribbean. Some of the islands in the Caribbean are still within uh, Arins, uh, service region, mostly along language lines. Most of the English-speaking islands are still in Arins region, but that's not even a fixed rule. There are some English-speaking islands that are in the like, region. I, I've, been, I've been asked many, many times how this Caribbean was split between Lagnik and Arin, and nobody apparently knows. So, um, a few figures, a few graphs about IPv6 uptake. This graph actually plots um, one of the indicators that I consider relevant in terms of routing. Uh, well, the blue line there is actually every alloc IPv6 allocation we've made. I have data starting on January 2013, so about three years worth of data. Um, um, the red line is how many of those allocations are actually visible in the routing table. This is not the same as uh, looking for routes or prefixes in the routing table. What I'm looking for is if there is one allocation, I will count this allocation as visible even if one small part of it is visible in the routing table. Right? On the other hand, if a pre prefix is being deaggregated, I will not count the number of routes, I will count one, right? So this tries to present the ratio between actual allocations and actual usage. You can see that um, the blue line most of the time grows much faster than the red line. It has to do, um, well, with some reluctance of people uh, in deploying IPv6, but it has to do mostly with a policy that was um, implemented uh, a while ago well, that actually says that in the Lightning region, if you want to ask for more IPv4, you have to request IPv6 as well, even if you do not an announce it on the round table. Um, the, there's, a, there's a strange jump in the graph. Um, this actually not that uh, the, the actual behavior of the network was like that. It's actually a, um, a mistake in the script. Some, some of the data sources changed, and I, it was a couple of months before I realized until I fixed the script. Um, so the good news is that the red line is growing. It keeps growing all the time. Uh, at some point, I hope, the gap between the red and the blue line will, keep, will, will start um, Becoming, becoming smaller. Um, this, is, this, is, this plot is for all the region as a whole. This plot is the same one, the same conceptual plot, except that it's only for Brazil. If you think that they look the same, it is because they look the same. This means that the Brazilian internet basically dictates the behavior of the whole region because it's so large. It's so large. It's over half of our membership is from Brazil. Um, 
Argentina, uh, it's growing. It's grow definitely growing. You can see that there's a very strong growth of allocations in Argentina, more than actual announcements. But in any case, it shows uh, an interest in, uh, in IPv6 deployment. Uh, these are two examples of very small economies with very few prefixes. And the funny thing about this is, um, for some reason, uh, you, sorry, uh, the graph uh, on the upper left side is Trinidad and Tobago, and the other is Curaçao, uh, two island countries. Uh, for some reason, in um, Curaçao, someone requested a prefix, and it was deallocated or something. Something very strange happened there. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think it has to do when, I don't know if you're aware that Curaçao is part of the Dutch islands in the Caribbean. And the Dutch islands in the Caribbean underwent a political transformation. There was a political entity known as the Netherlands Antilles that ceased to exist. And there were some changes in country codes according to ISO 3166. Uh, so, actually, there was a bit of confusion for, uh, about which country those prefixes were as, uh, allocated to for a while. Um, on the red line, you can actually see how people play with prefixes. They will announce them for a while, they will, they will withdraw the prefix. So, it's sometimes quite interesting to take a look at the smaller countries as well. Um, IPv6 uptake in terms of IPv6 user preference, this basically is Thanks, George, for all your data. Big round of applause for George. <laughs> this, yes, this, um, this is a small table showing you what the countries that uh, I arbitrarily define as showing significant uptake and that uh, threshold I completely arbitrarily set at 1%. So this is the, country f uh, the list of countries in our region showing user preference above 1%, with one exception. <laughs> two exceptions, actually. Two of those, of those lines require some comment. You will see that Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil are showing significant uptake. 7% of users in Brazil, it's huge. Brazil has 200 million inhabitants, 200 million people there. It has a mobile penetration of close to 100%. So it probably we're talking about several millions of users a day in Brazil. Bolivia is a very small, it's a very small market, it's a quite under, underdeveloped economy. However, there is an operator there that's basically converting all its, all its operations into IPv6. So they account to about 3% 3, 3 of all traffic in, in Bolivia. Ecuador is a very, case, a very interesting case study. The main driver there is a mobile operator uh, owned by the state. And Peru, which was for a long time the best success story we had have, we have to show in our region, keeps growing, although at a, at a slower pace, basically through the efforts of one operator, Telefonica Peru. And the last two lines deserve some comment because Belize is exactly at 1%. Have you heard about Belize? How many people here have heard about a country called Belize? I imagine as such. <laughs> Belize is a very small country situated on the mainland south of Mexico. It used to be called British Honduras. And it's a very concentrated market. It's a very particular place has some similar characteristics to, characteristics to other places in the Caribbean. Um, so it's quite interesting that they decided to deploy IPv6. Why? In the Caribbean, the internet is like nothing we know about. I mean, it has always been natted, right? Cla customers are used to be assigned private addresses. So many of the usual arguments we have to actually try to convince people to move to IPv6 have basically no meaning for them in the Caribbean. So it's quite interesting that they decided to move forward with uh, at least some deployment. Why the sort of question mark there in Belize? Because they are, this uptake in Belize is showing some wild oscillations. Uh, it sometimes grows, goes all the way to like 
one and a half percent and then crashes for some reason. Um, and then the other success story, which sort of success story is Trinidad and Tobago, which it was not one one percent, it was zero point nine eight, but I thought, come on, the guys are doing something, let's cut them some slack. Um, so some observation of early de on early deployments shows us that there is something of a learning curve. When you deploy IPv6, there are things that will break as you deploy more and more customers. Things happen. Look at what happened in Bolivia. They had a pretty big crash at some point. We still sadly don't know exactly why it happened. The, what we were told is that this was a routing issue. Something went amiss with the routing on IPv6. So it's not that they stopped using IPv6 on their customers, is suddenly their IPv6 routing became much less efficient or less optimal than their IPv4 routing. So um, due to happy eyeballs, browsers uh, went back to prefer IPv6, IPv4. Same thing in Belize and uh, in Trinidad, not as much, but there's something of the same behavior going on. Um, Something that many people will tell you that it's not possible. Is it possible to deploy IPv6 quickly in a large economy, in a large country? Well, it sort of is. So Brazil went from nothing, like from being basically dead, to close to 7% of IPv6 deployment in less than a year. So it's pretty, this is pretty fast. This is pretty quick. This means this probably are mobile operators. Not many, um, not, not probably not, not necessarily fixed operators, although one of the yes numbers that uh, shows significant uptake is a cable operator. Um, finally, I want to tell you something about a uh, field study, a development study that we run together with an organization called Banco CAF, which is uh, one of the development banks uh, currently active in the Latin American region together with the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. And um, this was a project that Lagnik proposed to CAF in order to get some financing from them to actually better understand the dynamics at play in the market and try to understand why IPv6 is being either deployed or not deployed, what are the techniques or technologies that are being preferred by the ISPs in the region, and um, hopefully draw some conclusions and propose some ways forward in order to, to improve the situation. The study was done in basically two parts. One um, involved a survey sent to LACNIC members, but also um, something that drew the most interesting things is that um, a set of countries was chosen, like a sample of countries in the region, and a lot of site visits were made with actual interviews with ISPs in the region. The re complete results will be published in this URL, um, hopefully next week, because uh, we are a bit, we're cheating a bit here. We can blame this on the time zone difference because we shouldn't actually mention this yet. Uh, there will be an official launch event for this study next week. But uh, we thought it would be a shame to, to let this opportunity pass without mentioning this, this study. A few numbers on the results. This is, this is actually the sample, the country sample. It includes some of the, we try to consider the different subregions, different economy sizes, and different economic development grade or status within, within the region. Um, ICAV6, one of the results of this study is we propose an IPv6 deployment indicator, an index you can refer to actually compare different countries and their status. There have been some approaches to do this, in particular this uh, Cisco IPv6 statistic, they try to do something like that, like weighting different parameters, like uh, IPv6 enable ASS, routes, prefixes, but we felt that the, the way that this index was, were built do not actually reflect 
were actually allowed to compare countries in our region. So we actually were are using the same data sources, but we, uh, based on the results of this study, pro um, <clears throat> will propose a new index that we believe better reflects the status of IPv6 deployment in our network, in our region. Um, the idea is that this index will be automated and will be available at the web page that is the URL, sorry, that is um, listed in the previous slide. This is, this is basically how it looks today. It was, um, this version was still calculated by hand on an Excel spreadsheet, but um, we believe it reflects, better reflects um, the, the status of uh, IPv6 deployment in different economies. Um, some interesting findings of the study. Well, the first is not really surprising. We kind of already knew it. Most of ISPs are still not offering IPv6 to their customers. But yes, also most ISPs have IPv6 enabled in their networks and their cores. Transition strategy. This was kind of a su surprising. Most ISPs apparently have settled on doing dual stack with private IPv4 and CGN for IPv4. The very few, if any, are considering using things like NAT64 or Foxifox XLAT or MAP, not even in data centers. I find, I find this quite surprising. I don't know if this is true for, for other regions, but uh, I would have thought that many ISPs could consider using things like, in particular, 464 XLAT. But apparently they are not. In, in, in fact, many of, not many of them have heard about that. Um, what are the main roadblocks in the eyes of ISPs? Um, one is a well-known one, one, which is CPEs, right? CPEs that are branded as IPv6 ready when you go test them. Well, they are not as IPv6 ready as you thought they would be. Uh, implementations are varying quality, and this makes quite hard for an ISP to commit to a firm deployment. Uh, however, the most relevant in, term, in, in terms of cost and perceived impact for many ISPs is the impact of IPv6 deployment or, them, or their provisioning systems and their BSS software, which is business support systems, right? Um, operations and help desk training was mentioned, but very few consider them a, this a, to be a big issue or a big problem. They think that this can be easily solved. Um, in the case of academic networks and universities, IPv6 is usually deployed all the way to the CPE at the different nodes of the academic network, but once you go inside each university's network, things break, are not, per, are not correctly configured, and there is this sort of um, administrative boundary between the academic network and the universities and universities and some, sometimes they are not properly coordinated. Similar thing applied to, to government networks. Uh, many or most portals, government portals are not IPv6 enabled and they have no plans to enable them. And um, one thing that could be helpful to actually move IPv6 track feed forward would be um, enabling IPv6 in community networks. In many countries, uh, Wi-Fi community networks are being used as a means to provide connectivity to underserved, co underserved communities, but very few of those community networks have firm plans to commit to IPv6, which is a shame. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> George. So I, I think you have to change your slide because I don't think you can say lower levels of V6 deployment anymore. I think in under a year with Brazil, you will probably service more V6 users than many other economies because they are enormous. I, I, I absolutely agree. The thing is when we started this study, we sort of assumed that IPv6 deployment was at a low level. The thing is perhaps not, it's not so low anymore, you know? It's hard to use, it's hard to ignore, sorry, like, 20 million users, right? If they have a problem, you will have to fix it. And it's no longer that easy to roll them back to IPv4. So it's sort of a, in, in the case of Brazil, for example, I believe they, they have hit a turning point. There's, there's no going back for that. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. So next speaker is um, Billy Himeit Chon from KISA. He's going to talk about IPv6 deployment status in South Korea. This could be a nice follow-up after hearing the GGM's interesting presentation. So Billy, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, actually, we are, we are having some I mean, exciting uh, afternoon. Uh, today, um, I'm here uh, to give an update on IPv6 deployment uh, uh, status in South Korea. Uh, I would like to talk briefly about uh, recent progresses and efforts for IPv6 deployment in private and public sectors and with uh, uh, some thought on IPv6 transition. Uh, actually, I wanna, I should have a, um, so prepare the slide, but I don't have it um, because uh, um, uh, I'm uh, give I, uh, I give update on behalf of uh, uh, IPv6 dedicated dedicated team in my company my company Kisa, uh, but um, just it was urgent, so I'm very sorry to you know give update without uh, slides. So uh, I want to start uh, my uh, talk with uh, the number 2.54, oh, what it is. Uh, before I came, I just queried the uh, Google IPv6 uh, uh, measurement site, and it turned the value of 2.54%, uh, um, which is IPv6 user data in February 2016. Uh, and you know, you can, uh, and two years ago, some I, Korean ISPs and CSPs practically deployed IPv6 on their uh, commercial services, especially in mobile. And I wanted to tell you what happened and what is behind this, uh, this figure, 2.54. Uh, um, IPv6 was uh, uh, developed in 1995. Uh, since then, the first IPv6 allocation to Korea was made for uh, Korea Advanced Research Network in 1999, and currently Korea has uh, uh, a, fair, a fairly good amount of IPv6 addresses, which is 5,245 in slash 32. However, um, we have kept quite a, a low profile in terms of usage, even though we tried very hard um, to deploy IPv6 in multifaceted ways. Uh, especially uh, to begin, uh, first uh, I want to tell you uh, what happened in, 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 in private sector. Uh, as George presented in his pr uh, pr presentation, SKT actually deployed, uh, deployed IPv6 on the voice and data of commercial LTE networks services in September 2014 and followed by this in December 2015, through collaboration with uh, KISA and major CATB operators such as uh, uh, CJ Hellovision and CNM and HCN, uh, also deployed IPv6 on their commercial led services. And this year, KT and content provider Naver also commenced IPv6 applied uh, uh, commercial services. Now, um, it is estimated that IPv6 services, uh, IPv6 are being provided to 11 regions uh, for about uh, 58,000 uh, subscribers in Korea. These, I think these explain the, uh, a certain IPv6 uh, uh, traffic from Korea on the Google IPv6 measurement site. Besides that, uh, I wanna tell you um, Korea has, uh, I mean, KISA has uh, developed its own index to measure IPv6 readiness for local companies based on whether the network carriers, backbone, and subscribers' networks support IPv6. So the index was also greatly improved from 19% in 2012 to 97 in 2015. Uh, 
And also in the, I want to also tell you about the efforts uh, being made, I mean made in the public sector. Every three years, uh, the Korean government and KISA uh, set up a national plan for IPv6 deployment. Uh, within this uh, uh, three-year plan, uh, I think it is noteworthy that um, we changed the policy uh, direction of IPv6 deployment from just changing equipment, equipment to service centered. I mean, now we are uh, recommend and encourage ISPs and CSPs to deploy IPv6 on their commercial services, while we just uh, you know focused on changing from IPv4 only equipments to IPv6 compatible equipments. In this context, um, Kisa launched a, a IPv6 uh, deployment sport, sport center in 2014. Uh, through this uh, center, uh, KISA provides uh, a help desk service, services, trainings, and also a test bed for IPv6 transition, especially with uh, uh, this, especially this year, um, with the test bed, uh, we are planning to upgrade the test bed to the level where um, security vulnerabilities in IPv6 environment can be uh, researched. And lastly, KISA also hosts uh, uh, annual IPv6 workshops and publishes guidelines to share technological and managerial know-how. And from institutional side, the government has made uh, all the ministries are obliged to procure IPv6 compatible equipment by laws uh, since uh, 2014. And also uh, the government uh, uh, exempted the income and cooperate tax in IPv6 equipment purchase, 3% for um, major companies and 7% uh, uh, for SMEs. Uh, these are uh, highlighted, uh, I think, uh, highlighted uh, efforts uh, made in recent years. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, made uh, uh, a lot of efforts with huge resources, but still, uh, we are, I think I should admit that Korea is uh, struggling with the challenging issues in IPv6 transition, such as um, the cost, uh, cost of burden for IPv6 transition is still high, especially for SMEs and small companies. Uh, there is no uh, proven uh, IPv6 uh, profit model and successful cases. And there is a fear and uneasiness against the IPv6 from security perspective. And there is a, yeah, uh, there is a merry-go-round between uh, companies in moving to IPv6. However, um, I strongly believe uh, um, it is important that we should get ready for IPv6 environment because, because it is a matter of time for IPv6 to be uh, adopted after all. Because the new technologies such as IoT, cloud computing will require more identifiers to connect a device to device, device to people, and I believe IPv6 will serve as a key enabler for, for the um, internet services with its innate features of uh, uh, mobility, security, and two-way communications. I'd like to close my uh, presentation here. Thank you. Do I have? Do I have? Question, comments? Okay. Okay, so let's welcome our last speaker for the day, uh, Yuya Kawakami from Internet Multifeed. He's gonna try, he's gonna talk about tried to provide IPv6 only networks steelessly at SEDEC 2015 conference. Okay. Do you Thank have you. enough beer for all of us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. So my name is Yuya Kawakami from uh, Internet Smart Feed, but uh, this is my personal work. So I'm uh, talking as a SEDEC Net uh, NOC member. And uh, today I'd like to share the data gathered from my experience. And uh, first, so SEDEC is the largest conference in Japan for computer entertainment developers. So they are not 
internet experts. Okay? And uh, we have a three days conference at Pacifico Yokohama, which is the uh, same venue as uh, ITF94. And uh, we have uh, 6,000 unique attendees in the last conference. And the SelectNet is a high available Wi-Fi network for this conference uh, operated by volunteers. And the way our motivation is uh, don't afraid of failure and uh, try something uh, like a new technologies. And uh, also that it is a good opportunity to intercommunicate between network industry and uh, game industry. And so there are max maximum about uh, 1,700 mobile stations. That is a very large Wi-Fi network comparing to ITF or Apricot. And uh, this is a Wi-Fi user's attribute. So almost all users are using mobile devices. This is a different from uh, such internet technologies conference. And 65% uh, of devices are made by Apple. This uh, trend is uh, very similar to the Internet Expert Conference. And uh, so we provided uh, IPv6 only network by default in such a conference. <laughs> and uh, this is an uh, announcement of Wi Fi network. So we just uh, say uh, there is a Wi Fi network and the SSID is a SEDEC net. We don't say this is IPv6 only network. <laughs> Yes, so we provided a network with IPv6 only and for non-internet experts and uh, sterilously, so without saying anything, and uh, that is by default network. Maybe I think it is a world first experience. Um, I had uh, provided a conference network in many conferences, but they are uh, something like a for internet experts conference. And uh, why we did it, it is uh, to Apple, so reveals maybe uh, I guess uh, in June of 2015 in WWDC conference. So they reject, they are going to reject uh, applications which will not work with NAT64 and uh, DNS64. So just to, so because of that, we decided to provide the IPv6 only network for this conference. And uh, this is an uh, external structure, overview of uh, our network. So left of down one is a <coughs> IPv6 only network. And uh, we translate uh, IPv6 only traffic by uh, NAT64 and DNS64. And for IPv6 traffic, so we are using uh, IPv6 IO, IPoE service. And that is uh, IPv6 traffic is uh, a little bit uh, strange in Japan because it is a uh, IPv6 access network and the ISP network is totally separated by FRED service. And uh, we also provide IPv4 internet connectivity via DS Lite, which is one of the IPv6 transition technologies, as you know. And this is a picture. And uh, so, so Mac and iPhone works perfectly in IPv6 only network, and, but Android does not work. But um, <clears throat> we are just providing IPv6 network with uh, DHCP v6, but Android does not support DHCP v6, and uh, according to this Wikipedia, so they support only RDNSS. So we should provide that R also RDNSS in addition to DHCP v6. And uh, PS Vita and the Nintendo 3DS, uh, which is a uh, mobile game devices, does not work. And uh, so, so mobile devices are mainly, so there is no data about uh, Windows. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, that is the impact on game industry. So we just announced the Wi-Fi network can be used as a test of it for the future requirement of iOS application submission. And uh, engineers from game, game industry noticed that, that so application which cannot work with this Wi-Fi network will be rejected. And they started to test. And uh, we, have a, we made a presentation about this Wi-Fi network. And uh, GameWatch, which is the most famous 
uh, game new site in Japan uh, was published this art article about this Wi-Fi network and this article ranked second on a, a list of popular articles. <coughs> this is a statistics of a one day of during a conference uh, so from 9 a.m. to uh, 9 p.m. So in total, 25% so traffic is uh, IPv6 traffic. And uh, this is a mobile station. <coughs> Uh, which is connected to the Wi-Fi. And the uh, red one shows the uh, IPv6 only network and the blue one shows the dual stack network. So uh, about 65% devices are connected to IPv6 only network and works well. And that is uh, about almost the same value as a uh, share of Apple devices. And we also analyze the DNS queries and uh, about uh, 220 million DNS queries, and uh, we found that uh, top 10 providers account for 75%, and uh, about 56% of queries are quad A queries. And, but that is because uh, it includes uh, DNS 64 queries. And we also provided uh, IPv4 connectivity via DNS, D, uh, sorry, uh, DS right, and uh, we especially configure the port, amount of port as uh, 64,000. Uh, in usual, so we configure the amount of a port for this something like a CGN or NAT technology with uh, 256 ports or uh, 524 ports, but uh, this conference supports uh, over 100,000 devices. So we use uh, just, uh, sorry, this is a type, uh, but we use just one IPv4 address for the NAT. And but the port are uh, exhausted at the first day, um, about uh, 4 p.m. So the lesson learned from this experience, so CGN port can be exhausted. NAT is not a permanent solution for IPv4 exhaustion. And the uh, <coughs> content providers can decrease the risk of IPv6 discommunication if uh, IPv4 discommunication if they deploy IPv6, and uh, approximately so 25% traffic can be released moved to IPv4 v6 v6 if the mobile carriers deploy IPv6, and uh, that means that. Uh, they can save the 20, 25% CGN ports. And uh, this is a iOS 9.2 release, which made in December. So in DNS 64 and NAT64 networks, so some issues are observed that uh, some, like a uh, PHP application like uh, Skype use uh, IPv4 literal address and they cannot work in uh, IPv6 only network, but Apple made a change on get other info function, and they, uh, this function become to return the NAT64 v6 address if, uh, if IPv4 literal was uh, um, passed to the function. And uh, for what? Is it useful? So, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication, which govern internet, internet in, uh, industry in Japan, uh, announced that uh, three mobile, large mobile carriers in Japan should uh, support IPv6. Maybe our data can be useful for estimate the traffic and uh, ports, CGN ports and uh, IPv4 address, which can be used saved. And thank you very much for my presentation. Questions? For a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody, thank you very much for coming back from the fire, fire um, evacuation exercise and stayed until the end. So this is the end of the um, today's session. IPv6 measurement both and I API IPv6 task force. So it's beer time now. Thank you very much. See you at the next meeting.